This is the American Law Journal. Call it what you will, the gig economy, the sharing economy, the freelance economy. Think Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, to name a few. Employment in America is changing dramatically. What are its implications and why is it spilling over into the courts? Welcome to the program. I'm Christopher Naughton. To gig or not to gig? That is the question. Gina Passarella with the Legal Intelligencer has this. Meanwhile, many Americans are making extra money renting out a spare room, designing websites, or even driving their own car. This on-demand, or so-called gig economy, is creating exciting opportunities and unleashing innovation. From the early days of the 20th century, America prided itself on not only being an economic powerhouse among nations, but also safeguarding its workers. But the rise of technology, cheap labor, and the entrepreneurial spirit is birthing something new, the gig economy. And it's challenging everything we know about business and laws protecting workers. I think both Democrats and Republicans want to embrace technology. They want to embrace the growth in jobs that technology can bring about. But it's also raising hard questions about workplace protections and what a good job will look like in the future. And there's the rub, and why the gig economy is finding itself in court. Shannon Liss Reardon, a Boston attorney, has gone after Uber, the poster child for the new economy. I've sued Uber for misclassifying its drivers as independent contractors, and by doing that, Uber has basically pushed all the costs and expenses of its business onto the workers, and, and the workers aren't getting the protections that they're owed under the wage laws and the employment laws. Two class action lawsuits have been settled in California and Massachusetts, giving drivers more legal protections, but still allowing Uber to classify them as independent contractors. There are more class actions to come. Another sector of the freelance economy under scrutiny is teaching. Growing trend at colleges and universities across the country, which increasingly rely on part-time adjunct instructors. The definition of an adjunct is a professional that has the same academic qualification as full-time faculty that's contracted to come work at the campus with no expectation of benefits. But here's the problem. They work without the safety net of what regular employees and other teachers get. They don't have benefits. They don't get paid appropriately. There's no workers' comp. Some people think, oh, adjunct faculty, that's quite an honorary stature. Well, not in these cases. It's really not that way. But with globalization and a surge in technology, the gig economy isn't going anywhere. With Uber, there's no benefits, but I, I think for me there's more benefits than no benefit. The benefit is that I can choose my own time, and it's a lot better than minimum, minimum wage work. By 2020, 40% of the U.S. workforce will be freelancers. How to balance the interests of entrepreneurs and create safe and fair working standards will challenge labor laws for years to come and, no doubt, continue to be fodder for political seasons. For the American Law Journal, I'm Gina Passarella. All right, five guests with us tonight, four in the studio. One will be joining us from Washington, D.C. in just a few minutes. Anthony Haller returns to our program. He practices all aspects of labor law with the top 100 law firm Blank Room. He's been advising us here on ALJ for over 13 years. Robin Bond heads up Transition Strategies LLC, the employment law firm which dedicates itself to representing individuals during their times of career change and challenge. Michael Salmonson has over 25 years of experience representing primarily employees in employment matters. The legal intelligencer gave his law firm Salmonson Goldshaw the Employment Litigation Department of the Year Award in 2014. And Jonathan Younger is a human resources expert with Agile Talent Collaborative and co-author of this book, Agile Talent, How to Source and manage outside experts. Well, the Atlantic Magazine, I think, summed this up pretty well, just about, uh, just a few months ago. And it said, in the sharing economy, no one's an employee. The jobs may offer flexibility and many other benefits, but traditional legal protections for workers aren't part of the package. What are they talking about, Michael? Well, what we're talking about is all the protections that you can get as a matter of law. The anti-discrimination laws, unemployment compensation, workers' compensation, all those things that we 
put out there as public policy to protect workers in the workplace? Well, the problem we have, Christopher, is that we have new, innovative, and disruptive technology and systems and companies that are providing consumers with something they really want. And the laws have not kept up with today's economy. And that's the trouble, because the laws that we're talking about, mostly, were written a long time ago, and some of them um, over a century ago. And they really didn't anticipate the kind of economy we have today. Right, we always say that the law is slow to catch up to technology. So you're, you're making the same argument here that, uh, that our workforce- are, you know, not just slow to catch up. They're old fan fashion, they're anachronistic, and they simply cannot apply to the type of work relationships that we have in this new economy. And Jonathan Younger, whether you love or hate the gig economy, let's say you're an employer, if you're not getting on board, you're getting behind. The reality is that more and more organizations are interested in using gigsters and freelancers for several reasons. One is certainly the cost advantage of hiring people on a part-time consultative or project basis. But in addition to that, the flexibility, the speed, and the innovation that these people provide is something that organizations want, need, and are buying at an increasing rate. So, Rob, I guess in some ways, this is something that's coming, it's here, everyone better get on board, but the whole notion is, do we do it legally, do we do it ethically, do we do it fairly? Well, absolutely, because one of the biggest things for all people who work is they want benefits, they want retirement, they want pension matches and things that, of course, you don't get if you're an employee. You know, for the past 15, 20 years, I've represented well over 3,000 executives in the negotiation of employment and severance agreements, and I have really noticed the over 50, over 55 segment of the population is turning into a lot of independent contractors. Contractors. Employers want their expertise. They want it when they need it, but they don't want it 24-7 and all the FMLA medical benefits costs and things that come with older workers. And I very much see this as a downside of the disruptive technology. So Christopher, it's really important to understand this isn't just about the new companies like Uber and Lyft. I mean, some of the most well-respected biggest Fortune 100 companies in, in the country are relying on what's often called the contingent workforce. And that's a combination of employees, but of people who are in some other kind of relationship, like independent contractors, outsourcing arrangements. There's a whole slew of techniques that these companies are using. And a lot of it is to do with agility, flexibility, and innovation. You know, that's true up to a point, but let's be realistic here. I think a lot of companies are also doing this to avoid paying unemployment taxes, paying uh, uh, workers' compensation. You know, the, the state of Pennsylvania a couple of years ago estimated that they were losing $6 million a year in unemployment comp revenue, and the unemployment uh, bank is basically broke in Pennsylvania. If you multiply that over all the years, and th this was based on people who were intentionally misclassified just to avoid the payroll taxes and just to avoid, you know, getting that coverage that they would otherwise have to pay. Agility is great, but, you know, some of these folks have been working five, six, seven years as independent contractors. That's not agility. In my mind, that's tax well, fraud. Well, Jonathan, then Robin, go ahead. There's a fact of the matter that some jobs aren't going to be full-time in these organizations, but in fact they're absolutely critical players. We need a legal system that enfranchises those differences. Not everybody's an Uber driver stealing work from a full-time driver. Well, when we were talking about the misclassification, I was thinking back to the original Microsoft case where mm -hmm. you had independent contractors, employees working right next to each other, essentially performing the same functions, but the Microsoft employees were getting those very lucrative stock options and the independent contractors were not. So, I mean, I think this is a really critical factor and there hasn't been that much true, true growth in companies recently. They grow by merging or by by cutting workforces or seeking economies that way. And I do think that there could be something along the lines of the equity packages that I see anyway, <laughs> that inspires companies to not want to classify people properly as employees. Well, the big losers, according to some, are the workers, despite the fact they're getting some flexibility, they're losing benefits and protections. The government, because they're certainly losing taxes, 
And although there may not be much empathy out there for lawyers or insurance companies, the insurance companies are also uh, losing work. And by way of that segue, let me introduce to the program tonight from Washington, D.C. This evening, Jim Quiggle, who is the director of communications with the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud. And Jim, in this gig economy, it's independent contractors and its employers who are gaming the system, no? Well, we, we often see, it depends on which we're talking about. Uh, misclassification is a big word for simply a dishonest employer who dodges paying state required comp workers' compensation insurance in order to fatten up their profits at the expense of workers. There are many dodges and ruses that they can do, but ultimately this costs the insurers and workers and taxpayers literally billions of dollars a year in stolen money. And on the other side of the equation, and again, this Uber class action was just settled in California, although it's still being litigated across the country, you can't tell me that there aren't thousands of drivers who are driving Uber cars and going back to their insurance companies and not telling them that they're actually driving commercially. That's another big suck on the insurance industry. That's another sense of deception or fraud. Well, it's, it's also dishonest competition. You will find, you go into some of the uh, little chat rooms that the uh, various rideshare companies drivers lounge on, and you'll see them advising each other back and forth how to lie to their insurance companies so that they can go ahead and continue driving commercially while telling their personal insurance company that they're still using the car only to go to the store and drive to work and take the family on Sunday outings. I think there's this issue of there really is unfair competition for the more established companies that play by the rules that really have their employees be employees. Um, you know, people, it means that their payrolls are higher, their costs are going to be higher. And, you know, I'm all for entrepreneurship. I'm an entrepreneur. I have my own law firm. I pay unemployment. I pay workers' comp, all those things. Um, have I ever had independent contractors? Sure, on short-term projects. But, you know, this idea that there are, there are companies out there that consistently do this to compete unfairly. You know, this isn't really an employer employee issue. This is a there's an unfair competition that even the the good employers who really treat their people as employees as opposed to you know, I was once on a plane with a guy who told me he worked for the same pharmaceutical company for 15 years as an independent contractor. Yeah, Michael, that's a really good point because it's the short-term nature that I think is really important to keep in mind for independent contractors. And how many of us don't know of interns or people in our own family that have been involved in these so-called uh, independent contractor situations and they're really just kids doing an internship for which they should be paid as a W-2? May I give you a con contrary point of view. By all means. And Go that ahead. is, a recent study was just completed by Field Nation and Workforce Trends. 74% of the people responding look forward to some form of freelancing. In addition to a full-time role as a freelancer, some 35% of 50 million people who classify themselves as freelancers are in fact moonlighting they have a full-time job, but they're doing contract work in addition. I'm sure that there are many organizations that are acting dishonestly, but there are many people that are looking for a different kind of employment experience than full-time employment, and these folks need also to, to be met. No doubt, Anthony. Well, I'm sure abuse is part of the problem, and I'm sure there is abuse, but we are missing the point here. The point is that we have a new economy. And it, uh, the conversation I'm hearing is a little reminds me of the Luddite movement, you know, <laughs> smashing some stocking machines to stop the Industrial Revolution. We're not going to do it. Right. Uh, right. And, and mm -hmm. what we're talking about are companies like Uber, like Lyft, that are making a very substantial contribution to the economy and wouldn't be able to exist in a system where everybody is an employee. So I think that what we're really talking about here is that we have laws that did not anticipate the kind of economy and the kind of jobs that are available today. And tapping in to what John said, there are many people that really like this concept of being in charge of their own business. I mean, the, the FedEx cases are a good example of that. FedEx drivers, many of them, now they, they've now been deemed by the Ninth Circuit not 
to be independent contractors. Exactly. But many of them liked owning their own vehicles. Many of them liked the ability to go and, and, and own other vehicles and have other people drive for them and have their own little business. Regarding the gig economy, absolutely, the genie's out of the bottle. This is uh, a big part of America's employment uh, future. However, the issue is not stuffing the genie back into the bottle. The issue is whether or not you can prevent people from illegally and dishonestly gaming the system to their advantage and to the disadvantage of others. The underground economy is very much underground. It's got America in its grips. This has been going on for many years. It's an old concept that's been around. We're seeing employers illegally stashing their workers into shell companies, hiding them, depriving them of benefits and using that to underbid honest employees for contracts. This is a taxpayer ripoff. Employees, who are, for all practical purposes, full-time employees are being treated and denied uh, legitimate state-required benefits. Uh, the gig economy is, is very similar in, in many ways. However, it's also being exploited dishonestly. We need to support the gig economy, encourage it, but we also have to manage it so that there's fairness across the board. Because this is the future of America, and it's something we, we need to nurture, but also manage carefully against fraud and dishonesty and deceit. Jim Quiggle with the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud in Washington, D.C. Jim, thanks a lot for joining us. So we'll be talking with you again in the future. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, Mike, circling back to our original point, so let's assume that we want the flexibility of people being independent contractors. That doesn't necessarily mean that they shouldn't be covered by, for example, the anti-discrimination laws. Should Uber, if we circle back to what we were originally talking about, should Uber be allowed not to hire an African-American driver simply because he's African-American? Now, the law says Absolutely. They're independent contractors. They're not generally covered by state law. I would say, you know, we need to look at that and say, is that really appropriate? Why shouldn't Uber be held to the same anti-discrimination standards as, an, as not an employer? And but wouldn't a plaintiff right. have a difficult time going against an Uber based on the fact that they are independent contractors if there is sex discrimination or gender discrimination or race discrimination, it's a much ro tougher road to hoe as a plaintiff. No? Well, if that they're independent isn't. contractors, then they're excluded from the statute and they can't Precisely. bring a claim. Right. right. I think, though, that there's a, a growing school of thought, and there's, um, there's a paper that's been written called The Hamilton Project, mm -hmm. where um, a number of scholars are advocating the creation of something called an independent yes. worker category that's right. in between mm -hmm. employee and independent mm -hmm. contractor, mm -hmm. where there would be protection for instance, right. for yeah. under the discrimination laws. And you have to laws. read it as, as a rap model, yeah. right? Of yeah. course. Well, that's right. <laughs> but, yeah, but, yeah. but one piece to this, which is when we're talking about freelancers, the gig economy, gigsters, we're doing something extraordinary. 50 million people in the United States alone have identified themselves as freelancers. That means 50 million entrepreneurs, 50 million people learning to manage their own business, figure out how to grow it, serve customers, build our economy. The payoff of that is so much greater than we can currently imagine. I'm so excited about what's happening here and around the world. Are there ways that the laws can support that entrepreneurship rather than diminish it? Uh, let's take a look at a video here. And this is a woman over 50, approaching retirement, wants to do some work on the side. Let's watch. So I had a dream and it said, to me, I can make a lot of money. So I went down, picked up my phone and started driving right away. Gordon now drives as much as 50 hours a week, calling Uber her pastime. She says she can make up to $850 a week as a driver partner. So the question I have watching that video is, is she aware of the insurance rates she's going to have to pay? Is she aware of her own liability? Is she aware of the cost of driving that car, safeguarding that car, safeguarding her passengers? And, and look, I, I agree with Jonathan, you know, ginning up entrepreneurship in America, great idea. But how many of these people going into this economy are really aware of the pitfalls and the costs? They're maybe skipping out on insurance, as Jim Quiggle was just saying a moment ago. And they're probably not aware, spending 50 hours a week in their car, that $800 isn't all theirs. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I have advised a lot of 
clients who basically have left corporate America, maybe not voluntarily, and would love to get another full-time job, but it's not forthcoming. So if they start their own businesses, I always say, if you do nothing else, get professional liability insurance. For heaven's sakes, you've got to do that. People say, really? Well, how do I do that? But there's a, a lot of things. You know, Anthony had made a comment earlier, um, you know, about maybe everything old is new again in a, in a lot of ways. This is kind of reminds me of we're going back to colonial times when everybody had to, you know, have their own businesses in, in, in essence. And that seems to be the, the way of the future here for, for many people. But I know a lot of people who would much rather just have a full-time job that pays the mortgage or enables them to at least get a mortgage. Because if you're driving, uh, you know, 50 hours a week to make $800, you might have trouble getting a mortgage if you need one. Robin, you're right. And kids these days, the millennials, don't trust big companies. They saw their parents laid off. They saw offers off the table. They're not excited about working in these companies. They feel safer, more secure building their own business, freelancing, than they do working for a company and being at the risk of that employer. They don't want to sell their soul to the company store, John. <laughs> and, and, and in addition to that, they don't want to lose their job on the whim of a manager as they saw their mother or father or aunt. But or what they do want is a level playing field. Yes. And I think this is part of the transition. And in some ways, there's not really a whole lot of, you know, sometimes between plaintiffs and defense attorneys, we have great duke outs. Right. It's a wonderful thing. But in some ways, there's not a whole lot of disagreement here. I think Anthony's right. This, this train has left the station. Oh, yeah. We're yeah. going and there. We need, how do we get Here's there? one of the problems. So you said that people might be doing these things without really understanding the mm -hmm. full implications. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's the irony and the contradiction in sort of the application of old, stale, traditional legal principles. So if Uber were to, to establish a detailed set of principles that sets out for every Uber driver the kind of insurance that they need to take, all of the implications, all right? which is exactly what Federal Express did for its drivers. Mm -hmm. The courts are going to say they're employees. They're employees, they're not independent <laughs> contractors. So the companies are sort of caught in the middle. They're in this vice where they can do neither right nor wrong. And, and I think one of the issues is, you know, there's intentional misclassification, and then there's the problem of the, the statute and the regulations are decades old. They, they were trying to put round holes into square pegs mm -hmm. or vice versa. Um, and, and they have to be updated and they're vague. And so companies can look and say, you know, it's all supposed to be about how much control you have. Well, control for an Uber driver looks very different than control of an office worker. And the regs just are not keeping up. We really need, I think Anthony and I would both agree, we need to look at these. We need to stop applying 20th century rules to the 21st century economy. It just doesn't work. There are probably 42 different government definitions of how to decide if somebody is an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. The IRS has one set of rules. The Department of Labor has another set of rules. They recently came out with guidance which essentially says we're going to go back to the very original definition, which is to suffer or to permit to work, which was a standard used for child labor to deal with middlemen that used to provide child labor. So it's very difficult for a company, even those that try and use the best judgment, to be certain that you've got it right. I'm completely in support of what both Michael and Anthony has said. The laws need to be a, a changed to, to fit the 21st century. In the work that we did in the book Agile Talent that we recently published, one of the things that was awfully important was in addition to the law, how well are organizations using these folks and how productively have they managed these folks. And there are clearly some ways in which organizations can do a better job of building a positive win-win relationship with every one of those independent workers, every one of those freelancers. In addition to the legal protections, there are good practices of management that need to be added, need to be formed, and need to be put in place. Yeah, because at the end of the day, Jonathan, maybe people say, yeah, I'd love to be an entrepreneur. Well, a lot of people get involved in multi-level marketing. And part of the knock on the gig economy has been the guys at the top are doing really nice. The guys in the middle, they're working hard, they're working hard, they're working hard. 
and there's a ceiling of sorts. They're never going to get anywhere close to those people that started that MLM. And you know, Anthony, maybe I can get you, get a little sympathy for the DOL here from you, perhaps because you're saying, look, we need new definitions. This train has left the station. We know it's coming. It's here. It's been here. It's only going to grow. So the Department of Labor is struggling with these definitions as well. A little sympathy for the devil here? Well, I wouldn't call them the devil. Well, <laughs> just a phrase I had to pull out of my hat. But, but, but someone that you, you I, folks I, do but duke I, with, but I, I do, duke it out But with. I do think that they create law in a very bureaucratic way and they don't really understand sort of the tectonic changes that are occurring within the economy. But, and but so, the, But there have been abuses with misclassification in this country. There's no so doubt about it. So it's a yeoman's it. effort is, is going to be what it's going to take for the DOL to prevail. And what I mean by prevail is to really make it good for both the employer and the independent contractor in this country so that both of those entities can be happy. Well, I think a lot of it's about, you know, the fact that if you're misclassified, then you're exempt from a number of the laws. In particular, DOL is concerned about the Fair Labor Standards Act, which means if you're an independent contractor and you're working 60 hours a week, you're not getting time and a half for that 20 hours, mm -hmm. more than 40 that you're working. So those are the issues. And the trouble for employers is if you get it wrong, and these are close calls often that are being made, the liability is huge and there are yeah. all sorts of class actions going on across the country. I mean, this has become one of the great plaintiff uh, litigation mills of, yes. of, yes. of, yes. of the 21st century. <laughs> then, then, right out of now, Forbes magazine, Robin. Yeah, but now that you have a uh, higher threshold where everybody who's uh, making up to $50,400 is automatically eligible for overtime. I think that should help. But, but what we need but to remember is that's not, just a floor. It's not right. a ceiling. Because you could be a nurse practitioner or um, a physician assistant, nurse anesthetist, which is a six-figure job, but you could still be eligible for overtime based on your duties and the scope of your licensure. But, but only if you're an employee, Robin, right? If you're an independent right. contractor, the dollar amount doesn't fit. And, you know, it's interesting because what Robin's talking about is they're going to raise the minimum standard for you to become an exempt employee, which yes. means that you're not entitled to overtime. It would be very interesting to see with, with those changes whether people who are in that 23,000, which is the old level, yeah. to the new 50,000, all of a sudden are going to all become independent contractors on hiring oh. so that you know, you're not going to have to pay them the overtime and make those other things. At the end of the day, we all agree this economy is moving forward. We need new definitions. Where do those definitions come from? Who comes up with them? Well, uh, it's an interesting point, Christopher. I was about to, to say this, which is that actually there's a little known um, category under the tax law called statutory employee. Mm. And a statutory employee is a, an employee who's not really an, in, he's not really an independent contra, he or she, and is not really an employee, but there are somebody uh, and it's used for insurance agents, yeah. by way of example. Mm -hmm. It's it's used for um, people who drive trucks uh, around the city to deliver, you know, bread or groceries. They don't own the truck, but they sort of work their own routine. So we already have a basic concept that there is something sort of in between normal employee and independent contractor. And on a statutory employee. The, the, the person to whom they provide services, or the company to whom they provide services, has to pay federal tax and has to pay into Medicare. And there's no reason that you couldn't create a system, which is what I mentioned, the Hamilton Project, mm -hmm. is suggesting that you create something that is like, an, like that, but is called an independent worker, and where you could build in mm -hmm. a number of these protections. We may see the independent worker in our lexicon soon. I want to thank my guest. This issue is not going away. Anthony Haller joining us once again from Blank Rome. Robin Bond with Transition Strategies in Greater Philadelphia. Michael Salmonson with Salmonson and Goldshaw and Jonathan Younger, HR expert with Agile Talent Collaborative. Thanks one and all for joining us. For all of us here at ALJ, thanks for joining us this week. Until next Monday night, case closed. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by The Legal Intelligencer, an American lawyer media company, and the oldest daily legal newspaper in the United States.